Amen, amen, amen. Hallelujah. Lord, we bless your holy name. We thank you for your goodness and for your mercy. We thank you for all the good things that you've done for us, Father. That no matter what happens or where we find ourselves, you're with us. You're watching over your word to perform it in our lives. Thank you, Father, for your mercy that endures forever. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Well, good evening, folks. Thanks for joining us for another live stream of our midweek service. I'm looking forward to the time we can be together again. I don't think any of us have any definitive time frame on that, but when it happens, it'll be great. I uh, Let's start in Proverbs chapter 4 this evening. While you're turning there, many of you know that a little bit about, above, uh, about my testimony, I was saved when I was a young child and grew up in the church. I went to a church. It was a Baptist church. The people there loved God. They loved each other. They were wonderful, wonderful people. But there was a, well, how do I say this? There was something missing in my Christian life. I loved God with all my heart. I talked to him. I can't remember a time that I didn't talk to the Lord on the inside of me. I didn't know anything about being a spirit being. I certainly didn't know anything about spirit, soul, and body. But I knew that there were things that the Bible referred to and even a few promises. I don't want to leave the impression that I knew a lot about the Bible as a, uh, a teenager and in my early 20s because I didn't. But I knew enough to recognize that the things that the Bible said you could have, well, I just didn't know anybody that had them. It was in many ways burdensome. Brother Hagin used this illustration in um, where God sent Moses to Pharaoh to say, let my people go. He described to him and Moses described to the people that it wasn't a land that they had to water by foot, but it was a land that was watered by the rains of heaven, a land of hills and valleys and so forth. Well, in Egypt, they watered the ground by their foot. There were apparently these treadmill-type contraptions that would pump the water as they would walk and create a pumping action. And Brother Hagin used to say that that was kind of like how a lot of people's Christianity was where it was all about work it was all about toiling it was all about trying to do the right thing or trying to be the right kind of person and it became well at, at, at the very least it was difficult there were things that I remember being taught in the Baptist church by these people that loved God with all their heart. And they were teaching the most of what they knew. I really don't hold them at fault for anything. Because we're all responsible for ourselves in our own situations. But there were things that were preached to us and taught to us. That became burdensome because we didn't have the power to carry them out. We didn't have the power to be righteous in ourselves. Nobody does. And for that reason, there was a time where I turned away, not from God. He was always there with me. I talked to him and prayed just like I always had. But I slipped in my dedication to the things of God. I had come to the place where I had pretty much accepted that the kind of Christian life I was living, try to do your best and fail, 
Repent and try again to do your best and fail. Repent and try again to do your best and fail. That pattern, I think I began to accept that that's just the way it was always going to be. But then I came across some teaching tapes, some cassette, cassette tapes by Brother Hagen. And it turned my life upside down. Here was a guy that was preaching that the Bible was true, that God meant what he said, and that you could have what the Bible says was yours, that which was purchased for us by the precious blood of Jesus. And I wanted it to be true so much, I grabbed hold of it instantly. I wasn't convinced it was true yet, but I grabbed hold of everything that I could get, all the teaching materials, and it wasn't as abundant then as it is now. You couldn't just go online and find sermons and that kind of stuff. But I found a man that experienced some of the good things that the Bible says belong to us because of Jesus. Well, I wound up not too long after that attending, moving to Tulsa, Oklahoma and attending Rhema Bible Training Center the school that was founded by Kenneth Hagin Ministries. And I had the opportunity, well, I, I should say it this way, I guess. The Lord just created a place for me to have a relationship with Brother Hagin so that I saw that it wasn't just things that he preached from the platform, but that he lived what he preached. I saw the power of God work in him and through him to benefit others, but also God took care of him and the things pertaining to his life. And I got to witness that as well. And I found that the overriding principle, the foundation for victory, came one and only one way, comes only one way, and that is through the word. Proverbs chapter 4, verse 20. My son, attend to my words. Incline thine ear unto my sayings. Let them not depart from thine eyes. Keep them in the midst of thy heart. For they are life unto those that find them. And health to all their flesh. Verse 23. Keep thy heart with all diligence. For out of it are the issues of life. The word of God. Is everything. It's of paramount importance. I have a lot of compassion for people that are stuck in the place where they're trying to be righteous. I remember how miserable I was for years as a teenager because I wanted to do the right thing. I wanted to please God. I wanted to walk righteously as, I, as, as the Bible instructs us to. But I couldn't find the power to do it. And so there was this goal set before me that was absolutely unattainable in my own strength or in my own power. But we're not supposed to operate in our own strength or our own power. We're supposed to establish ourselves in the Word so that the Word of God, which is the power of God to rescue, deliver, and to heal, and so forth, we make a place for the Word in our lives so the Word can make a place for us. I've always loved Bible stories. I've always been drawn to the stories of people that experienced victory in their lives, even in the Old Testament, under the Old Covenant. And I found something about these people that I greatly admired. I love the story of Joseph. I love the story of Joshua. I love the story of David particularly Goliath and his conquest over Goliath, his victory over Goliath. I've come to appreciate the story of Abraham. I love the story of Daniel and the three Hebrew children. And I began to see something about these men that God used under the Old Covenant. 
these men had a place for God's word in their lives, a place of prominence concerning the word of God in their lives. And as a result, these men conquered fear. And it was their conquering of fear or let me back up and say it was their appreciation for the word of God that enabled them to walk as conquerors over fear. I see Jesus in the the four gospels and Jesus was absolutely fearless in the face of sickness and disease. He was absolutely fearless in every case, in every circumstance, in the middle of the storm that seemed like it was going to to capsize and swamp the boat that he was in. He didn't get all bothered about it. He was fearless when he spoke to the storm and it ceased. This coronavirus situation that we find ourselves in the middle of I hope it's coming to an end as far as the government control over the citizens of this country. But when we were in the beginnings of these things, fear is the thing that the Lord began impressing upon me, pressing, impressing my spirit to talk about and to give hope to remind us of what the word of God says rather than just rely on the mass hysteria that was ginned up mostly by the media. It seems clear that Jesus wants us to operate in the same way he did. He said the works that he did we'll do also. And even greater works because he goes to the Father. Well, if we're going to do those same works, we're going to have to develop the same fearlessness that Jesus had. We're going to have to to develop the same fearlessness of some of these guys in the Old Covenant. Turn with me to Joshua chapter 1, if you will. Joshua chapter 1, beginning in verse 1. Now, after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord... It came to pass that the Lord spake unto Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' minister, saying, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now therefore arise, go over this Jordan, thou and all this people, unto the land which I do give to them, even to the children of Israel. Every place that the sole of your foot shall tread upon, that have I given you, as I said to Moses. From the wilderness and this Lebanon, even unto the great river, the river Euphrates, all the lands of the Hittites and under the great sea going toward the going down of the sun shall be your coast. There shall not any man be able to stand before thee all the days of thy life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with thee. I will not fail thee nor forsake thee. Be strong and of good courage for unto this people shalt thou divide for an inheritance the land which I swear unto their fathers to give them. Only be thou strong and very courageous, that thou mayest observe to do according to all the law, which Moses my servant commanded thee. Turn not from it to the right hand or to the left, that thou mayest prosper whithersoever thou goest. This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that's written therein. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, And then thou shalt have good success. Have I not commanded thee? Be strong and of good courage. Be not afraid, neither be thou dismayed. For the Lord thy God is with thee whithersoever thou goest. First thing God told Joshua in preparing him to take Moses' place as the leader of the children of Israel. To take captive the promised land and to defeat their enemies inside that promised land the first thing that God tells Joshua is that he's going to have to overcome fear and walk in and walk courageously before him be not afraid neither be thou dismayed for the Lord thy God is with thee whithersoever thou goest 
Verse 8 is the verse of Scripture that we're all familiar with. This book of the law, meaning the word of God, shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that's written therein. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. He tells Joshua that the principle of success is to speak the word. Speak the word. That's what meditate means. It means to utter or to say. Day and night, speak the word. In every situation, in every thing that you encounter, speak the word. And you'll make your way prosperous and you will have good success. Folks, this is one of the foundation scriptures upon which the victory of our Christian lives revolves around. You're not going to find any Christian to be successful without acting on verse 8 to speak the word now this is so fundamental it's so simple the words that we speak even in numbers chapter 14 after the children of israel 40 years before had come to the edge of the promised land you remember the story how the ten spies went in and, and spied out the land ten of them came back with an evil report that evil report was to say the land is what god said it was it's a land that flows with milk and honey but they're too strong. The people in, that live in that land are too strong for us. We can't take it. Caleb and Joshua, however, had a different report. They said, since God's on our side, of course we can take it. Let's go up at once and possess the land. But the crowd believed the multitude. Uh, I'm sorry, the multitude believed the majority report. And so they failed to take the promised land. Now in Numbers chapter 14, God's dealing with the aftermath, the immediate aftermath of the children of Israel yielding to fear, the fear of the people, the Hittites and the Amorites and the Amalekites and whoever else was in the land, the Canaanites. They've yielded to the fear that was generated by the ten spies saying that we can't take the land because of the strength of the people that live therein. So in the aftermath, the immediate aftermath of the children of Israel yielding themselves to fear as a nation... They yielded themselves to fear. God told Moses to tell the people in no uncertain terms. He said, here's an eternal law or a principle. He said it this way. He said, as truly as I live, that phrase simply means just as God is eternal, so will this principle be eternal. Just as God is unchanging, this foundation principle will be unchanging as well. He said, I will deal with them as they have spoken in my ears. So the words that we speak give God the opportunity or rob him of the opportunity, one or the other, to make good his will and his plan and his purpose in our lives. Forty years later, God tells Joshua to meditate or to speak the word of God. Now, what word of God did Joshua have? It wasn't like he could get out of his smartphone and dial up his Bible out and search through the scriptures to find different promises and different things that were available to him. He didn't even carry around the five books that were written by Moses, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Moses was the author of all of those books except for the last eight verses of the book of Deuteronomy which tell about his death and God burying him in the mountain. That was written by Joshua. Those eight verses, those last eight verses were written by Joshua. So when God tells Joshua to meditate in the word, what's he telling him to do? He doesn't tell him to memorize the ten, even the Ten Commandments. So what is he supposed to speak? Well, the verses that we just read, verses 1 through 9 of Joshua, the first chapter of Joshua, the promise that God made to him that nobody would be able to stand before him as the leader of the children of Israel or stand before Israel as his chosen people. That's what Joshua meditated on. Joshua meditated on the fact that God told him four times to be courageous. Joshua meditated on the, the reality 
that God said not to be afraid or dismayed because God would be with him just like he was with Moses. I'm sure that conjured up some memories for, for Joshua as to certain things and how certain things took place, things that he was privy to, things that he witnessed firsthand. How that God used Moses to deliver the people as far as the people would allow him to. So Joshua is really meditating, if we, if we boil it down even further, Joshua is really meditating on the fact that God told him not to be afraid but to walk courageously and the promised land would be theirs this is similar to what happened with Abraham the Bible tells us that Abraham when he was about a hundred years old had given up on the promise that God made to him unto him 25 years earlier but God started talking to him about having a son. Moses, uh, um, Abraham knew that neither his body nor Sarah's body functioned in that manner any longer to be able to have a child. So God speaks to him about an impossible thing, an absolutely impossible thing. And we find out from Romans chapter 4, that it became the thing that Moses, uh, that uh, Abraham focused on, the promise that God made when he showed him the stars of the sky and brought to his recollection the sand on the seashore and said, so shall thy seed be, beyond number. But that was the promise God made to him, so shall thy seed be. And the Bible says in Romans chapter 4 that Abraham was strong in faith by looking under the promise of God. In other words, he's meditating on the promise. He's reminding himself of what God had promised. That he'd not only have a son, but that his seed would be like the stars of the sky. Without number. Abraham wouldn't turn loose of that. He spoke the new name that God gave him, which means father of a multitude or father of many nations. Every time Abraham spoke everything that Abraham thought on, everything that Abraham did, and we see that as an imitator of God, Abraham called things that be not as though they were. Well, that had to include what he said about his body. Furthermore, he was an imitator of God who quickens the dead. So that means that Abraham had to speak life to his body. I imagine it became something of a regular occurrence. And not too long after God appeared to Abraham to stir him up about having a child, he brought Sarah in on the proposition as well. Abraham told Sarah what God had said. He told Sarah that God said about a year from now or a year after this time when he appeared to him, they'd have a son. Both Abraham and Sarah are listed in the Hall of Fame of Faith Heroes in Hebrews chapter 12. So Abraham and Sarah received the impossible. They received the impossible. Somewhere along the way they had to conquer fear. Probably the reason that Abraham is laughing at God's renewing of the promise of having a son is because he knew that his body didn't work that way anymore. And he asked for Ishmael to be blessed because he was convinced at that point that he could not have a son. We've got other stories in the Bible of people that did virtually the same things. They put the word of God first. 
Joseph's the story that I've always loved. Joseph tells about, uh, the story about Joseph tells about the dreams that he had of being exalted above his brothers and even above his mother and father. Now, Joseph probably didn't do a too smart a thing by sharing them, uh, those dreams with his brothers, but he did, and they hated him for it. And so you remember the story how that they threw him into a pit and sold him into slavery. He found himself in Egypt and he became steward of Potiphar's house. He didn't get bitter and let that control his life. He didn't take the position that God you've done me wrong. But instead, he allowed the Spirit of God that was on him to use him wherever he was. You remember also the story, I'm sure, about Potiphar's wife lying about what Joseph had done, and he was cast into prison. I'm sure to Joseph, that looked like maybe the end of all things. Here he has a dream about being exalted by God and winds up in prison in a foreign land, the land of Egypt. I'm sure things weren't working out the way that he thought that they were going to after he had the dreams. But he kept after it. He did the best that he could with the situations that were presented to him. And he pretty much became second in charge in the prison. He winds up interpreting the dreams for the baker and the butler, Pharaoh's baker and Pharaoh's butler. And after the butler is restored to Pharaoh's house, just like Joseph said, he forgets about Joseph until the king has a dream. Nobody could interpret the dream. And then the butler remembers and he talks about what an excellent person or excellent man Joseph is and how the Spirit of the Lord is upon him. I'm trying to find the scripture here where it tells about the butler. I'll start in Genesis 41, verse 1. And it came to pass at the end of two full years that Pharaoh dreamed, and behold, he stood by the river. And behold, there came up out of the river seven well-favored kine and fat flesh, and they were fed in the meadow. And behold, seven other kine came up after them out of the river, ill-favored and lean-fleshed, and stood by the other kind upon the brink of the river. And the ill-favored and lean-fleshed kind did eat up the seven well-favored and fat kind, so Pharaoh awoke, and he slept and dreamed the second time, and behold, seven ears of corn came up upon one stalk, rank and good, and behold, seven thin ears, and blasted with the east wind sprung up after them. And the seven thin ears devoured the seven rank and full ears, and Pharaoh awoke, and behold, it was a dream. And it came to pass in the morning that his spirit was troubled, and he sent and called for all the magicians of Egypt. And all the wise men thereof, and Pharaoh told them his dream. But there was none that could interpret them unto Pharaoh. Then spoke the chief butler unto Pharaoh, saying, I do remember my faults this day. Pharaoh was wroth with his servants, and he put me in ward in the captain of the guard's house, both me and the chief baker. And we dreamed a dream in one night, I and he. We dreamed each man according to the interpretation of his dream. And there was there with us a young man, a Hebrew, servant to the captain of the guard. And we told him, and he interpreted to us our dreams. And to each man according to his dream did he interpret. And it came to pass as he interpreted to us, so it was. Me he restored into mine office, and him he hanged. 
Then Pharaoh sent and called Joseph, and they brought him hastily out of the dungeon. And he shaved himself and changed his raiment and came in unto Pharaoh. And Pharaoh said unto Joseph, I have dreamed a dream, and there is none that can interpret it. And I have heard say of thee that thou canst understand a dream to interpret it. And Joseph answered Pharaoh, saying, It is not in me. God shall give Pharaoh an answer of peace. He's not saying he can't interpret it. He's saying the gift is not his. It's from God. And Pharaoh said unto Joseph, In my dream, behold, I stood upon the bank of the river. And behold, there came up out of the river seven kind, fat-fleshed and well-favored, and they fed him in a meadow. And behold, seven other kind came up after him, poor and ill-favored and lean-fleshed, such as I never saw in all the land of Egypt for badness. And the lean and the ill-favored kind did eat up the first seven kind. And when they had eaten them up, it could not be known that they had eaten them, but they were still ill-favored as at the beginning. So I woke. And as I saw in my dream, and behold, seven ears came up in one stalk, full and good. And behold, seven ears withered thin and blasted with the east wind sprung up after them. And the thin ears devoured the seven good ears. And I, was, I told this unto my magician, but there was none that could declare it to me. And Joseph said to Pharaoh, the dream of Pharaoh is one. God has showed Pharaoh what he is about to do. The seven good kind are seven years. And the seven good ears are the seven years. The dream is one. And the seven thin and ill-favored kind that came up after them are seven years. And the seven empty years blasted with the east wind shall be the seven years of famine. This is the thing which I have spoken unto Pharaoh. What God is about to do, he showed unto Pharaoh. Behold, there come seven years of great plenty throughout all the land of Egypt. And there shall arise after them seven years of famine. And all the plenty shall be forgotten in the land of Egypt and the famine shall consume the land and the plenty shall not be known in the land by reason of that famine following for it shall be very grievous and for that the dream was doubled unto Pharaoh twice it is because the thing is established by God and God will shortly bring it to pass now therefore let Pharaoh look out for a man discreet and wise and set him over the land of Egypt let Pharaoh do this and let him appoint officers over the land and take up the fifth part of the land of Egypt in the seven plenteous years. And let, it, let them gather all the food of those good years that come and lay up corn under the hand of Pharaoh and let them keep food in the cities. And that food shall be for store against the land, to the land against the seven years of famine, which shall be in the land of Egypt, that the land perish not through the famine. And the thing was good in the eyes of Pharaoh and in the eyes of all of his servants. And Pharaoh said unto his servants, Can we find such a one as this is, a man in whom the Spirit of God is? And Pharaoh said unto Joseph, Forasmuch as God has showed thee all this, there is none so discreet and wise as thou art. Thou shalt be over my house, and according to thy word shall all my people be ruled. Only in the throne will I be greater than you. And Pharaoh said unto Joseph, See, I have set thee over all the land of Egypt. And Pharaoh took off his ring from his hand and put it on Joseph's hand and arrayed him in vestures of fine linen and put a gold chain around his neck. And he made him to ride in the second chariot which he had. And they cried before him, Bow the knee. And he made him ruler over all the land of Egypt. And Pharaoh said unto Joseph, I am Pharaoh, and without thee shall no man lift up his hand or foot in all the land of Egypt. It says Joseph was 30 years old when Pharaoh made him prime minister of Egypt. We know that he was a teenager when he was taken by his brothers and sold into slavery. So we don't know exactly how long it was, but it was probably somewhere around 13, maybe 15 years before the dream came true and God exalted him to the place that he had for him. But what if Joseph anywhere along the way had decided that he was just going to be a complainer and complain about how unjust and how unfair life had been to him. He would have had that opportunity when his brothers put him in the pit and sold him into slavery. He would have had that opportunity when, Pharaoh, when Potiphar's wife lied and caused him to be thrown into prison. He would have had that opportunity when the butler failed to mention him. But every time 
Joseph just does the things that he needed to do. He was such, of such an excellent spirit that he wouldn't let anything get him down. Now, folks, I want to suggest something to you. I can't prove it to you from the Bible, but you can't disprove it either. So it's at least something that's worth consideration. I don't believe that Joseph could have become the prime minister of Egypt from Potiphar's house. We look at the injustice that was done, and I'm sure he felt the, unju the injustice much so than we could ever imagine. But God was at work. God was steering him into just the right place. I'm not saying God had Potiphar's wife lie about him. I'm saying that in every instance, because of the excellent spirit that was in Joseph, he rose to the top. He rose to the top in slavery, became the steward of Potiphar's house. He rose to the top in prison and became second to the captain of the guard, the governor of the prison. And he rose to the top because he maintained an excellent spirit so that even when he stood before Pharaoh, Pharaoh could see the wisdom and the spirit that was upon this guy. We see the same thing in David. The Bible tells us about after David was anointed to be king in Saul's place. We know that he was about 17 years old at that time. The scripture tells us, 1 Samuel chapter 16, I think it is, tells us about David and the spirit that he was of. He developed himself while he was taking care of the sheep. He was motivated by an excellent spirit to make of himself the most that he could. He was courageous. We see that courage in effect when he went out against the lion and the bear and delivered the sheep from their mouths. It would have been real easy just to sit back and not put himself at any risk and just lose one sheep in each case. But he was a man of principle. He was somebody that refused to be just good enough in his job. Even though his job was not considered to be a great thing. David conquered fear before Goliath ever showed up. And it was his conquering of fear that enabled him to convince Saul to let him go down against Goliath. And, of course, we know the, the outcome of the story. He defeated him with, his, with his slingshot and a stone. We see the same thing in Daniel. Daniel and the three Hebrew children chose to put the Word of God first place in their lives. They chose to be a doer of the Word. Now, they weren't any different than David would have been or than Joshua would have been. They didn't have a Bible to work from. But they remembered the law of Moses concerning their diet. And so they asked the dean of the school that they were in under Nebuchadnezzar to let them eat according to the law of Moses rather than the other things that the king was feeding them from his table. They were allowed by the dean of the school to live for 10 days on just pulse and water. I guess that's some kind of oatmeal type thing or cream of wheat or something like that. And at the end of the 10 days, they appeared to be in better health than all the rest of the ones that were eating the other foods. Now that putting of God's word first place in their lives opened the door for them to be used of God in a much greater way. We hear the story or read the story of the three Hebrew children that were brought before the king because it was reported on them that they would not bow down to worship the image, the golden image that he set up of himself. So he threatens to throw them in the fiery furnace and he questions them. He says, what God will deliver you out of my hand? And they fearlessly answered him. They said, if you do throw us in, God will deliver us. 
if you don't throw us in, we're still not going to worship your golden image. And it says that Nebuchadnezzar flew into a rage. Nobody talks to kings like that, I guess. And so he commanded the furnace to be seven times hotter than it had ever been. And he threw them in. And because it was so hot, it slew the mightiest men of his army that were responsible to throw them in. But it's not long after that he sees there's not three people in there but four. And the fourth one, he said, looked like the Son of God himself. And so he calls them out. And they came out. They're no longer bound. The fire burned away their bonds. But it didn't harm them. There wasn't even the smell of smoke upon them, the scripture says. How did these guys conquer fear to the point where they were willing to say to King Nebuchadnezzar, the mightiest king in the earth at that point in time? How were they able to stand so boldly before him? Because they had been putting the word of God first place in their lives. In everything up until that point in time. And they found that God was faithful. I'm sure there were many things that they had experienced that we don't have record of in the scripture. But they had developed their confidence in him by first putting him first in the things that they ate. Folks, when we put God's word first in everything that we encounter, we set ourselves up in a situation where we find God to be faithful, where we experience his faithfulness. It's just as Romans chapter 12 talks about. It says, beginning in verse 1, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Most translations say spiritual worship. Verse 2 goes on to say, And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove or experience what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. When we put God's word first in our lives, when we choose to act out of our hearts, out of our spirit being, to do what God's word says, it brings us to a place where our confidence in God is so increased we recognize that there is nothing to fear. God doesn't want us held in bondage to anything. He doesn't want us held back from any of his blessings, from receiving any of his blessings first and foremost, or from walking into, entering into his perfect plan for our lives. I'm going to close where we started up in Proverbs chapter 4. My son, attend to my words. Incline thine ear unto my sayings. Let them not depart from thine eyes. Keep them in the midst of thine heart. For they are life unto those that find them and health to all their flesh. That's what the word of God will build on the inside of you. But here's how to use the word of God after it is built up inside of you. Keep thy heart with all diligence. For out of it are the issues of life. Well, how, do our, how does our heart send forth those issues those spiritual forces through the words that we speak. When we put the word of God on the inside of us, when we build our spirit man up in the truth of his word and then speak what his word says, those spiritual forces are unleashed. It brings to pass that which we have said just like Jesus spoke to the fig tree and it obeyed him. Folks, we have a responsibility to be strong in the Lord, especially in these last days. Especially in times like this, when fellow brothers and sisters in Christ, because of the lack of foundation of the Word of God in their lives, are swept away with the fear and the panic, just like the unsaved are. What a privilege it is for us to be able to build our lives on God's Word. What a privilege it is for us to have the word of God at our fingertips so that we can dedicate ourselves to it, so that we can meditate therein, 
so that we can be observe so that we can observe to do according to all that's written therein to make our way prosperous and to have good success in whatever God gives us to do what a privilege we have let us be of an excellent spirit like these guys in the old testament are or were let us have the same spirit as Joseph or as Joshua or as David or as Daniel let us be men and women in these last days that are fearless before kings and rulers just like the three Hebrew children were before Nebuchadnezzar let us apply the word of God in our lives so that we conquer fear so that we are in a position to be used of God to glorify the name of Jesus let's pray Father thank you for all that you've done for us Thank you for what you've given to us. Thank you, Father, that the foundation of your word in our lives keeps the storm from taking us out. But no matter what storm rages or how the wind blows or the rains pound upon our lives, no matter how difficult or severe or long-lasting, the storms of life are against us because we have built our lives upon your word. We will not go down. We declare, Father, that we're free from fear. We refuse to be afraid because you're with us. We refuse to be dismayed for you are our God. You strengthen us. You help us. You uphold us with the right hand of your righteousness. And in your righteousness we are established. Oppression shall not come near us because we do not fear. Neither shall terror come nigh unto us. No weapon formed against us shall prosper. But every tongue that rises against us in judgment we do condemn. This is our heritage as a child of God. And our righteousness is of you. We bless you, Father. We thank you for upholding us. We thank you for seeing us through. We thank you for manifesting your glory in these last days. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Amen.